welcome back to Be What Review. My name's Andy Shaw. Uh, this video is a little bit of deja vu. If you remember, uh, a couple of weeks ago I made a video about uh, Rick Beato, who puts on some videos on Bebop, so I wanted to review him, a, a critical review. Anyway, in those videos, I actually filmed myself watching Rick Beato's videos, and Rick Beato complained to YouTube and had my video took down. Not only did I have my video took down, but I also got a strike against my channel, and uh, which is uh, subject for three months, so I've got a strike for three months. And I also had my channel suspended until I did a course on copyright infringement, which wasn't very nice, having to do all this. Uh, so I'm not quite happy with Rick Beato about that. I think he should have just, if he, well, you know, if, if he was that bothered about it, he could have written to me, you know, just sent me a little note, and I would have took the video down, you know, don't want to upset anybody. But now he's done that and upset me, you know, I mean, it's, uh, what's, what's the Buddhist call? This is uh, karma, you know what I mean? I've got bad karma now, so I'm going to carry on with this uh, video, but we are, it's copyright, so I just want to talk about these videos that Rick Beato did. He's put on three videos, right? Uh, they call Principles and Melody Bebop Lines. The first two is basically technical stuff. We just, all he does, he uses standard melodic analysis, right? Which is not actually used a lot in bebop now. The, I mean, you're supposed to know it and, you know, passing notes and all this kind of stuff and tensions. But a lot of bebop, true bebop, this is the bebop of the 1940s, is patterns. So they use, a lot of people who talk about bebop don't use standard melodic analysis, although you, you're supposed to know it. And they talk in relation to patterns, you see. That's one thing. Uh, the third video talks about John Coltrane, which I thought was a, a bit of a strange one because it, John Coltrane is not really a great bebop player. He's, you know, he's not part of that 1940s group. He's 1950s hard bop and then you know, his later stuff, you know, like Love Supreme and Ascension, all that stuff, which you won't, you won't call that bebop. Uh, so Coltrane's music is really John Coltrane's music. It's something you listen to, you know, and enjoy or whatever, is John Coltrane's music. Giant Steps is not really bebop because the hard bop era was more about original compositions. They wanted to try and get away from what was happening in the bebop era and write their own compositions and like subdue the music a bit. If you listen to Joe Coltrane's music, it's nowhere near as rhythmically complicated as Charlie Parker, but the harmony is very, is very advanced. Uh, and also with Coltrane's music, especially Giant Steps, you've got that tonic axis where you, you take sidle fifths and you take different tonics, and then what you do is you end up with more than one key center. Okay. Uh, which you don't really get that much in bebop, you know what I mean? If you're, if you're doing, looking at bebop tunes, you've got a key, a key what you're looking at, and you can analyse most of the stuff from just looking at key, you know. You don't have to put multiple key signatures in, really. Uh, so I don't think Coltrane is a good tune to look at. It, it would have been much better to look at a great bebop solo or something. i tell you what would have been a really good one to look at, and that would I, I'd have liked to have seen it, it would be Parker's Mood. An analyst of Parker's mood because Parker's mood is not just a great bebop solo; it's also a great blues solo as well. I mean, it's just you know, it's probably the greatest blues in all of modern jazz. You know, uh, Parker's mood. So that would have been a good one. Anyway, I wrote some notes down here. The th first thing I noticed is that Rick Beato's side he's got seventy-five thousand subscribers, and he's got this. He's trying to build up this reputation. If you read some comments on Rick Beato's sites, you get people say, "Oh, you're so talented," and all that is. And if people say that enough to somebody, if people start think believing their own publicity. You know what I mean? Uh, so you know, I, I would say to all these people who think that Rick Beato's some kind of genius and and all this, you know, sit down and listen to some Charlie Parker or Bud Powell or Clifford Brown. You might change your mind. Uh, another thing is that. Rick Beato is always going about subscribing, subscribe to my channel. So it's, it seems to be his channel is about making money. And also it's it's like uh, it, he's trying to appeal to a wide audience, whereas I'm not. 
<laughs> my my audience is bebop. I love bebop, and that's it. And I've got no compromise on any other music. So I ain't gonna be saying, you know, this is good and this that's nice and any kind of compromise, you know. So I'm not too bothered about any subscribers. I'd rather have ten subscribers who are into the same music that I've got than seventy five thousand people who are just not interested. You've got to compromise and and try and make them happy. I'm not interested in that. So he, he's trying to build a reputation up and because I'm crit I criticised him in that first video, he has, to, he has to pull my video down. I, I, assume, I assume that's what he's doing. I, I, sorry, I criticise other people and use their content in my videos and I've never had a bad back from them. I criticise the New York Jazz Academy and they're quite happy, you know, and also Music Education for All, which is a very good site, I actually think, uh, and they never criticised me. In fact, they actually altered their video. They put anecdotes in to add my criticism. So, so people are all different, aren't they? We're all different. Anyway, the, let's just carry on with these. Uh, what I've said about Rick Beato. Right. Uh, the first thing is he talks about general bebop, you know, and, and probably general players, whereas I don't consider a lot of modern players to be bebop players, even though people call them bebop players. Like Richie Cole is called a bebop player, but if you listen to his playing, very little bebop. But he's trying to appeal to a wider audience, Richie Cole, and so a lot of his music is very straight on the beat swing and, and that, and then he puts in little bits of bebop that sound quite exciting in his solos. So. But he's not really a true bebop player compared to Charlie Parker, which is all complicated rhythm and that. You've really got to be listening and, you know, absorbing it. Uh, in the video, when he puts the video on Rick Beato, the first thing we see is, uh, this is in Principles of Bebop uh, number one. I'll actually put all the video, links to all the videos that he does underneath this video so you can go down and click and watch it yourself if you want. In fact, it might be better open it up in a separate browser so you can switch from what I'm saying to what he's doing. Anyway, he puts a, a 2 5 1 pattern in, but he goes, he, he puts in 2 5 major 7. So in C major, that would be D minor, G7, C major 7. And the thing is that G major 7 was not a, a chord that we used a lot in the bebop era in the 1940s. It was nearly always G, the solid trad, or G6. The thing about G major 7 is, it's, it can be a chord that you don't want, especially if you're playing the root of the chord, which he does. If you, if you look at Rick Beato, he put a, a video on called How to Play Through Rhythm Changes, I think, and he put, shows you a solo, a solo, and the very first chord, he holds the root of the chord on a major 7 chord for a whole B, and that's bad. I think it, in that in that video, it's B flat, the chord is B flat major seven, and it hits the note B flat. Now the thing is, when you hit a, a root of a major seventh chord, what's, what's happening is, you've got the major seventh chord there, right, the major seventh, and you're putting the root on top, and that interval is a minor second, which is a dissonant interval, you don't want that, you wanna be avoiding minor seconds if you can. And he does it on the very first beat of his, uh, his I got rhythm change, uh, how to play through rhythm changes. He, he plays this line going up and straight for one whole beat, hits the, the tonic of the, of the key on a major seventh chord. Really not very good at all. You don't, you don't want to be playing uh, the tonic on a major seventh chord. And he does it also in the first example he puts on. He put it towards the end, he, put, he plays a major seventh he plays, a, sorry, a, ton, uh, a tonic on the major seventh, so he plays a G over, you know, over the top of the F sharp, which is a minor second, not very good at all, so, so that's really bad. Uh, yeah, and he, he talks about you've got to play chord tones on B, and this is exactly the same thing again. You don't want to be playing chord tones on B if it's a major seven chord or anything with major seven. Keep away from chord tone on B. You've got to think about what you're doing. He also says that you use a Dorian mode on a minor scale, which is normally true, but it's not always true. You can get dominant, uh, people like Barry Harris and David Baker say that you should play uh, what's called a dominant scale, right, over a minor chord, right? Uh, so it, that would be like a mixolydian scale over the minor chord and, and the 
seventh chord, you know what I mean? So you, you, normally on a D minor seven, you would play Dorian, then G7, you would play Mixolydian, whereas they're saying that you play Mixolydian on both, or the dominant scale, which is a Mixolydian scale, on both those chords. So I just said that, that that's a, another bone of contention. Uh, he talks about extensions to chords, and this is something else. He's, he's talking about principles of melody as though it's a beginner's, and he's talking about extensions like flat nine, flat five, and all. And you've really got to know what you're doing with there because all that kind of stuff is related to what key you're playing in. So I don't know why he's talking about that at all. You should keep away from extensions. If you're doing something simple, keep to be in bebop. You want to be sticking to the basic tensions on chords and keep the chords basic as well. Rick Beato plays the line that he's put on video and his rhythm is all, he plays the line on and everything's off the beat so it's da 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 like that, that's how the line is. The thing is that bebop, one of the main things about bebop is it's rhythm, it's com complex rhythm and if you listen to the way he plays and play like that, it's, that's not bebop, it's not bebop rhythm. Bebop rhythm is quite complex like I've just said. And with bebop rhythm is, the accents can be off the beat, on the beat, all over the place, you know what I mean? In, in a, a group of, of like six eighth notes, you could have three accented and then the, ex, the next three accents. So the beat can be on the beat, off the beat, things like that. Parker accents high notes, kills low notes. He uses triplets to run in between. There's much much more to it than than that and the volume is also important you, you get brighter and louder as you go higher and then softer as you go down in bebop so you're always hearing very strong dynamics which is also emphasized with the rhythm it's it uh i think i think uh, barry harris talks about it in in one in his workshop videos about the rhythmic aspects of of interval leaps and stuff right uh, within bebop so moving around in bebop also not only creates rhythm but also creates dynamics which also create excitement uh, you get quite a lot of it in Charlie Parker's music who's the greatest bebop player so the thing about what I'm trying to say about this is is if you listen to the way Rick Beato plays on those lines that he did in those videos that's not bebop rhythm Although, like I say, I've, I've seen B, uh, Rick Beato in some of his other videos, and his rhythm is more interesting to listen to. So that's another thing. Let's just have a look, see what else said. Oh, yeah. Actually, looking at what Rick Beato has actually written, he's written these musical examples. Something that really irritates me, and I'm always coming on about it, and I think my subscribers are really fed up with me saying it, but I'm going to keep on emphasising it because it's so important. When you're writing something out to explain to somebody about bebop, you must put a key signature in. And he doesn't put a key signature in. He puts the first example in, in G major, which he says, but he doesn't put the key signature of G major. He puts, just, well, he doesn't put a key signature, just as though it's written in C. And it's really the worst thing you can do, not putting a key signature in when you're talking about bebop. When you're studying bebop, you really want to see a key signature because it makes it so much easier. You can identify tetrachords instantly. You can identify patterns instant instantly. You can look at the chromatic added notes and see them instantly. Right, I I've criticised things like the Charlie Parker Omnibook because that's, an that's another one that has no key signature. It's really difficult to study. When If you play alto sax like I do, if you're looking at a tune like Ornitholy, which is in the key of E major, that's four sharps, so it just ends up becoming a complete mesh. You can't identify where the where the chromatic adder notes are. You can't see tetrachord patterns. You can't well, you can't see anything. It's just it just becomes a mess. So I really want to emphasise this to. It's mainly Americans who do this. So don't put key signatures. I really want to emphasise this to you that anybody who who talks about bebop and doesn't put a key signature in really hasn't got a clue i don't think key signature is ultra important you must put it in to any solo or anything any example you're showing somebody so they can see things clearly you know i mean my background is engineering that's that's where i was trained up to, to be an engineer 
And in engineering, you've got to be able to communicate things across. And it's the same in music. You, can, you put it across, I don't know why it is with Americans, but they don't seem to have this emphasis on good communication, you know, good, good writing music and good, you know, just good practices. And it's very, very important to get good practices across. So I would say to everybody who was watching this video, really put a key signature in when, you, when you're uh, writing music. Put it down as a strong one. E. Also, another thing is, uh, I think I've just talked about this, I'm not sure, but it's basically terminology. Uh, bebop terminology is different. He, he to, the, the terminology he talks about in that video is flat nine, he, he talks about nines and elevenths and passing notes and all that. Whereas the terminology in bebop, speaking about bebop, is mainly about patterns, mainly since Thomas Owen's uh, classic. 1974 uh, PhD dissertation, which is which is actually emphasised all the patterns. So now, when we talk about bebop, we go into patterns. I know I've just talked about this. So th this these things, I don't want to go on and on about all this, right? Uh, and I don't want to emphasise too much. Uh, Rick Beato did put. I'll tell you one thing that he did. He, he put a, one of his examples, and I think it's example three. Tell you what, I'll get back to you in a second. I'll just check where it is. Yeah, on, on the example two, if you look at the example two, I think that's the best line that he's wrote. Uh, there's problems with example three and examples one. Uh, example two is not bad. If he gets rid of them G major seven chords and puts G normal G chords in, they're actually quite nice lines, that. I played that second one myself on my alto, and I just had altered the first one because I don't like starting straight on B. I just played a little pattern before that. And it sounds really nice, that. And there's some good voice lean example, too, as well. His voice lean is quite nice. That would be, you know, I would say that's a very good, uh, a very good line. You know, it sounds, sounds OK. So, uh, so that's all I want to say, really, about uh, Rick Beato. I could talk a lot more about him, but I don't want to, actually. Uh, and I think his fans are, you know, the people who follow him. Although I must admit, if you're a fan of Nick Rick Beato watching this, I must admit I was quite impressed that I didn't get any actual insults. I mean, 600 people watched that last video and I didn't get one insult uh, from Rick Beato fans. So they must be quite civilised people. Uh, I got 10 people marked it down, six people marked it up, but uh, not getting insults, that's very impressive. So. So I was very impressed by that. But, uh, you know, when you think about criticism, I mean, what's criticism? It's just somebody's opinion, isn't it? It doesn't really matter that much, you know what I mean? What's, what's my opinion, really, you know what I mean? What you should do is, you should look at what I say and see if it adds up, you know. If it doesn't add up, then you ignore it. That's how I tell all my subscribers. Never, never take anything what anybody says as gospel. It's just, that's really suicidal. If you get a... A person, you see them as some kind of god and everything they say is accurate. It's suicidal, I'm telling you. I've found problems with everybody I've ever read on Bebop. You know, I'm, I've been looking at Barry Harris and there's a lot of stuff in Barry Harris I don't agree with. A lot of stuff I do agree with. But, it's, you know, and he's a, he is a top Bebop player, Barry Harris. You know, and I, there's certain things that it just doesn't add up when you look in the 1940s at the really top people like... You know, Charlie Parker, Bud Powell and Clifford Brown, who I consider to be the three greatest bebop players. They don't do what Barry Harris said you should do, you know. it's, it's So, criticism is is something that you need to be looking into yourself, not, not listening to what I say or anybody else, and not seeing everybody as some kind of pedagogue, you know. It's just suicidal, I think. So, uh, that's all I want to say, really. So, uh, see you next video.